everyone. Hello. Welcome back from spring break. How are you all doing? Still easing into, into it? Well, it's great to see everyone. I hope you had a fabulous break. Um, I know many of you, but for those I don't know, I'm Karen Wong, the Executive Director of the David J. Epstein Program in Public Interest Law and Policy. Um, and before we begin, I do want to acknowledge our presence today on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Tongva people and their role as the traditional land caretakers of Tavangar, which includes the LA Basin and the UCLA campus. So thank you all for joining us today on your first day back from break for our spring 2024 Margaret Levy Public Interest Fellow Lecture. Um, as many of you know by now, the Levy Fellow Lectures are a signature event for UCLA Law's public interest programs. And we are excited to welcome our spring speaker. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about in a minute. But first of all, um, the Margaret Levy Fellowship brings to campus uh, an outstanding public interest lawyer each semester to share their cutting edge legal work and to provide advice and mentorship to students pursuing public interest careers. So for six years, the Levy Fellows have been inspiring students like you with their work, which ranges from individual client representation to litigating class actions, from protecting civil rights to reforming entire legal systems, and from enforcing laws to advocating on behalf of grassroots movements. This year, in particular, in recognition of the ongoing and deep housing crisis in Southern California, we have focused on speakers whose work has been at the core of our state's struggle for housing access and housing justice. Um, you may remember our Fall Levy Fellow, Rashida Phillips with Policy Link, uh, addressed a lot of the policy level work that she was doing around housing. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our Spring 2024 Levy Fellow, Shayla Myers, who I know um, knows some of you in the room. Um, Shayla is a senior attorney uh, in the Unhoused People's Justice Project at the Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles, otherwise known as LAFLA. LAFLA, for those who aren't yet familiar, is one of the largest, it might be the largest, poverty law firm in the nation, serving more than 100,000 people every year on a range of issues, with housing as one of its core practice areas that actually spread across multiple units, and Sheila actually heads um, the Unhoused People's Justice Project um, to, uh, to anchor the work that she's doing. Um, through the Unhoused People's Justice Project, Shayla works alongside community organizations, unhoused residents, and tenants to end the criminalization of poverty. She does this primarily through litigating in state and federal courts to secure the civil rights of unhoused residents and to prevent the expansion of laws that criminalize homelessness. She's been involved in a number of cases um, at the leading edge of housing justice, which I'm sure she'll talk about today. Um, it, inc it includes serving as lead counsel currently on a case challenging the constitutionality of public space regulations in the city of Los Angeles. Before joining LAFLA, however, Shayla was a Skadden Fellow at the Los Angeles LGBT Center. She was an associate at a plaintiff's civil rights law firm here in LA. She was a law clerk for the Ninth Circuit, so she did a lot of different things um, before landing here. So for those of you who feel compelled to find like the direction as you graduate, just know that you can do amazing things without knowing for sure as you leave the building what that thing is. Um, she's definitely going to talk about her career path and opportunities to work at LAFLA and to kind of issue and work in the housing justice space on Wednesday. Um, so I'll come back to that again at the end, but um, there is a career talk um, at lunch on Wednesday. Um, most importantly, introducing her, I wanted to say that she is a proud alum of UCLA Law, having graduated with both the Epstein program and the critical race studies specialization uh, in 2008. So I'm delighted to welcome Shayla back to campus today for her talk, which is titled House Keys, Not Handcuffs, fighting against criminalization to achieve housing justice, in which she's going to examine the intersection of criminalizing poverty, racism, and housing policies, and the fighting for the rights of the unhoused in Los Angeles. So on behalf of UCLA Law and the Public Interest of Programs, thank you, Shayla, uh, for joining us this week, for making time in your busy, hectic litigation schedule to come share your vision and your passion with us. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Shayla. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me? Is that good? Okay. Thank you so much, Karen, for welcoming me. Thanks to Grace 
Um, thank you all for coming. I uh, did not fully appreciate that you all were coming on the day after your spring break, uh, so I really, really appreciate that. And I especially appreciate that you came out today in the middle of the work day to talk, or school day, school day, um, to talk about the criminalization of homelessness, which is a significant issue that is facing us here in Los Angeles. Um, I'm really excited to be back here at UCLA. Um, the first time that I really started thinking about homelessness in Los Angeles and the criminalization of homelessness was here at UCLA. Um, I was really lucky to take Gary Blasey's Fact Investigation Clinic, um, where we focused on investigating the role of the Mental Health Services Act um, and the ways in which the funding of health services impacted folks who were unhoused. And it was actually through that clinic that that was the first time that I actually met organizers with the Los Angeles Community Action Network, which is a black-led organization in Skid Row that fights against the criminalization of homelessness. Since I took that clinic at UCLA and since I had a chance to meet organizers at the Los Angeles Community Action Network, and more specifically, for those of you who know, Steve Diaz, um, who gave me my first tour of Skid Row and has since become one of my best friends in the criminalization work, um, I've actually spent most of my career working on issues related to homelessness and housing. I started out working for my first job as a Scadden Fellow, working with queer and trans youth who are homeless in Hollywood. And for the past 10 years, as Karen mentioned, I've been litigating about whether and when, under what circumstances the city of Los Angeles can throw away a tent. During my time working on homelessness, I've worked with, along un, unhoused folks and organizations like K, LA Can, K-Town for All, and other organizations throughout Los Angeles who are fighting to end the criminalization of homelessness. As part of that fight, we have fought against the city of Los Angeles' practice of seizing and destroying unhoused folks' belongings. We've challenged the constitutionality of the city's public space regulations, and we've litigated what the city has to do when it stores unhoused folks' belongings. There are, of course, nuances to each of these cases, but at a very basic level, I've been litigating about tents and, sometimes incidentally, a jacuzzi. A couple of years ago, in a case that I am still litigating, that some of you know quite well, um, Garcia versus City of Los Angeles, we secured what our team often lovingly refers to as due process rights for a couch. We are being glib when I say that. Um, the case is obviously about much more than that. Um, but at oral argument, the Ninth Circuit, at the Ninth Circuit, three very smart judges grilled me about why I thought the city of Los Angeles couldn't just throw away a jacuzzi on a city sidewalk. Um, but we actually won that argument. Um, surprising to us, but in 2022, the Ninth Circuit held in what was a very straightforward ruling that it violates unhoused folks' Fourth Amendment rights to throw away their belongings simply because a city says they are too big to be on the street. That case and all of the cases that we've litigated about the seizure and destruction of unhoused people's belongings have been at a very basic level about the extent to which constitutional rights afforded to people over their belongings extend to unhoused people who are living on the streets. And there are a lot of unhoused folks who are living on our streets. Los Angeles is in the middle of a homelessness crisis, and this is probably, of all of the things that I can say in a room, the least controversial thing that I can say. Every day, 75,000 people are unhoused in Los Angeles, and 75% of those folks are actually unsheltered and living on the streets. To put that number in perspective, and it is hard to put that number into perspective, the unsheltered population who are on the streets of LA County are thousands more than the entire student population of UCLA. So this weekend, when it was pouring rain, when it was when it, the temperature fell below 32 degrees at night, more than 50,000 people in our county had no shelter. And this summer, when it will be 110 degrees in the valley, there will be 50,000 people who won't have access to drinking water or showers, let alone air conditioning or even often shade. So by any stretch of the imagination, the fact that this many people are living on our streets is absolutely a crisis. But I also do think that when we talk about this crisis and what is happening on our streets, we shouldn't talk about it as a homelessness crisis. It's far more productive and far more honest to frame the conversation about how we got here and why it is that we stay here as a city is because that we are in the middle of a housing crisis. And even more importantly than that, we are in the middle of an affordable housing crisis. 
So to put that crisis in perspective, there are more than 500,000 too few affordable housing units in Los Angeles County. Los Angeles is a city of renters. How many of you all are renters? I assume most of you. Um, more than half of all renters in Los Angeles are rent burdened, which means they spend more than 30% of their income on rent. I assume, based on my understanding of what it is like to be in law school, that is most of you. And I also assume, given that most of you are here attending this lecture, that you might be public interest lawyers, which means it's highly likely that you too will be rent burdened. Um, you're not alone. More than half of rent burdened, most of more than half of renters in the city are rent burdened. The average rent in Los Angeles is more than $2,500 a month, and you'd have to earn more than $39 an hour, or twice the minimum wage, just to be able to afford a two-bedroom apartment in Los Angeles. These are not controversial numbers to anyone who has looked for an apartment in Los Angeles. And yet, when we stop talking about housing and we turn the conversation into a conversation about homelessness, that conversation shifts dramatically. Despite all evidence to the contrary, there is a prevailing myth in our city that unhoused folks are on the streets because they want to be there. The myth of shelter resistance, the idea that unhoused people are resistant to coming inside, is one of the most prevailing myths that's out there. I hear it all the time. We hear it from law enforcement officers who tell that to us when we're monitoring sweeps. We hear it from politicians who are speaking to the public who are saying that folks are there because they want to be. And we hear it from house residents who are justifying why we need laws that make it a crime to sleep outside. Like I said, if you spend any time looking for housing in Los Angeles, you can know how hard it is to rent an apartment or to buy in a house. And yet when it comes to unsheltered homelessness, we completely forget that folks who are on house face exactly the same challenges. They just have to face those challenges of looking for an apartment when they're on the streets. Yesterday morning, uh, I woke up to the sound of rain and a headline from the Los Angeles Daily News. Uh, how many of you have heard of the Los Angeles Daily News? It is, a, it is another paper here in Los Angeles that primarily serves the San Fernando Valley, and it actually has incredibly high readership. And last yesterday morning, the Los Angeles Daily News proclaimed that LA County and the city of Los Angeles were offering interim housing during the storm. The lead, the interim housing options for people experiencing homelessness will be available during this weekend's severe weather. It was a promise to readers that our unhoused neighbors would be safe during the storm that the county's most vulnerable residents would be okay when it was pouring rain outside. And there was a photo accompanying the story of an unhoused man hovering under an awning in the rain with a shopping cart and an umbrella. And the import of that photo and the headline was clear. There is shelter available for folks who want to come inside. If he's outside or if you see his neighbors outside, they are there because they want to be there. But what the headline didn't say and what unhoused folks and advocates who know very well, who after months of navigating these systems and is that and navigating the empty promises of the city and the county, is that the city and county were offering a fraction of the number of emergency housing vouchers that we needed for people to come inside. For the casual reader of the story, 240 vouchers were how many were being offered. And that number might seem like a lot. What the story leaves out is the denominator. What they leave out is the fact that we needed 50,000 vouchers for people to come inside. So when you add that fact into the mix, releasing 240 vouchers starts to feel much more like a press opportunity than it does a solution. But by leaving it out, the reader who knows nothing about the breadth of the problem also knows nothing about the scope of the solution. They know only that they feel better believing that their unsheltered neighbors had someplace to go last night during the storm, and they have only themselves to blame that they're still outside. And that is the myth of shelter resistance in our city. This isn't one isolated story. These are the same narratives that play out every day in the mainstream press, on social media, and at City Hall. The myth of shelter resistance is pervasive, and it persists in almost every public discussion on homelessness that happens in the city. And it is very easy as a constituent in the city to buy that myth. Because as house residents, it's much easier to believe that folks are unsheltered by choice 
than it is to accept that we live in a city with so much wealth and equality that 50,000 people are sleeping outside each night through no fault of their own. In many of the same conversations that we are having about shelter resistance, we are also talking about substance abuse and mental health. We are talking about people who point to shelter resistance oftentimes point to substance abuse and mental health as reasons why folks are on the streets. But even if in, our home, in the housing crisis today, substance abuse and mental health play a role, that role is to tell us which folks are likely to end up on the streets, not that there will be unhoused folks who are, un, who are unsheltered in the first place. Every city in this country is struggling with substance abuse and mental health of its residents. But not every community has the level of homelessness that we have in Los Angeles and throughout California. In fact, in other, other parts of the country have much higher rates of substance abuse and mental health issues, but far lower rates of homelessness. In communities with more affordable housing, people with mental health and substance abuse issues are much less likely to end up on the streets. The, the same is true for rates of mass incarceration. There is absolutely a correlation between being system involved and ending up unhoused in the city. The deeply racist criminal justice system that leads to the mass incarceration of black people at a far higher rate than any other population contributes to the fact that in Los Angeles, while 8% of the population is black, almost one third of the unhoused folks on the streets of Los Angeles are black. But mass incarceration, like substance abuse and mental health issues, it doesn't cause homelessness. A lack of affordable housing for people coming out of, home, of prison does. Which is why, for 10 years, I've been litigating again about tents. Because tents on the sidewalk remind us that people who are outside are there because our city is facing an affordable housing crisis. And because for a city like Los Angeles, it is much easier to throw away a tent than it is to build an apartment. And it's also much easier to arrest people for being homeless than it is to fix the structural failures like wealth inequality and racism that has led to 50,000 people being on our streets every night and a half a million people in our county just one missed paycheck away from ending up there. In three weeks, the United States Supreme Court is going to hear a case, Grants Pass versus the city of Grants Pass versus Johnson. Um, it's a case out of Oregon that will decide whether or not it is cruel and unusual punishment to cite or arrest someone who is unhoused for sleeping in public when they have no place else to go. Many of us who work on these issues are holding our breath, I think for obvious reasons, as we wait to see what the Supreme Court decides. We know that the first question that they have to get to, to answer the question of whether it's cruel and unusual punishment to punish people for sleeping outside, is whether or not the Eighth Amendment ban on cruel and unusual punishment actually places any substantive limits on what a city can criminalize and, in turn, who a city can deem a criminal. And that scope of the Eighth Amendment is one of the fundamental questions that will be before the court today. And the question about what is a crime and who is a criminal is at the very heart of what we are fighting about when we are fighting so hard to end the criminalization of homelessness. To be clear, the decision of what is acceptable in society and what is not, about what is allowed and what is illegal, that forms the basis of what governments are entrusted by its citizens to do. When we elect our representatives, we are electing them to make decisions about what is a crime and in turn, who is a criminal. At a fundamental level, every state has the power to define what kind of conduct is criminal. The decisions they make when they make those decisions about what constitutes a crime, does more than just determine who goes to prison and for what. The decisions about what is criminal shapes how we view the people who engage in that conduct, who are the criminals in our community. We all know this, that the history of the abuse of power in this country is as long as the colonization of this country. From slavery to laws that made it a crime to marry a person of a different race, to sundown laws that made it a crime to be on the streets after dark if you were a person of color. Laws passed in this country by our elected representatives have made it a crime to cross a border. They have made, there have been laws that have made it a crime to engage in sodomy, to have an abortion. There are laws that have made it a crime to teach kids about evolution and trans rights 
and now critical race studies. Politicians and governments have the ability to define what it means to be a crime and who is a criminal. And for decades in Los Angeles, what that has also meant is that our politicians have had the ability to criminalize poverty and to define people who are living on the streets as criminals. And we do that so we can blame poor people for being poor. And this is what makes the criminalization of homelessness so insidious. Not just because it punishes the most vulnerable members of our community for engaging in sustaining life activities outside, although it is definitely insidious because it does that, but what makes criminalization so deeply flawed but also so seductive to politicians is that like the myth of shelter resistance, criminalizing homelessness shifts the focus and the blame away from the structural forces that have created the affordable housing crisis in our communities, and it places the blame on folks who are on the streets. By criminalizing homelessness, we are quite literally turning folks who are unhoused into criminals. Here in Los Angeles, there is a lot of debate about a municipal code, Los Angeles Municipal Code 4118. How many of you have heard about that law? It's a law that has gotten a lot of attention. It has been on the books since 1968, um, but it was amended in 2021 to ban unhoused folks from sitting, sleeping, or lying within 500 feet of schools and daycares. It also gave politicians the ability to pass resolutions that ban unhoused folks from within 500 to 1,000 feet of highway, freeway underpasses, libraries, parks, homeless shelters, and other, quote, sensitive sites. The debate, the debate that has ensued in Los Angeles since the law was amended about whether, where tents would be prohibited on sidewalks has allowed politicians to shift the focus of the public conversation in our city away from the policy decisions that got us here in the first place and onto the individual decisions of folks who are on the streets. Rather than discussing how to fix our city's homeless policies, we have had to debate where unhoused folks, and can, unhoused folks can and cannot be in public. And of course, by centering the debate around schools and daycares and later parks and libraries, the public debate has allowed people to assume, without ever interrogating why, that unhoused people should not be around our city's children ignoring the fact that a significant number of people who are unhoused on our streets are both children and the parents of children. The implication and sometimes the explicit justification about this law is that unhoused people on our streets are more dangerous than people who are housed. That kind of shift in our conversation doesn't happen overnight, but it has happened in Los Angeles by debating laws that prohibit people from having tents on our sidewalks, and now, by being around our kids. The locations that are banned under this law are more often than not the places that unhoused folks have chosen to be. They are the places that unhoused folks have determined are the safest and the clearest places where they can survive. For a hundreds of reasons, unhoused folks have chosen to set up their tents because they are the best places for them to be whether it's because it's the brightest places or the darkest places, it's the least populated or the most populated, it's the places that are the most protected from rain or the closest to resources like caseworkers and outreach teams, they are the locations where unhoused folks have determined that they should be. And in return, our city council has passed hundreds of individual bans that target those specific locations. The result is a patchwork of regulations that have displaced hundreds of unhoused folks and have made the regulations next to impossible to follow. And as a result, every day, thousands of folks living on our streets are not just unhoused, they are by definition criminals. Enforcement of Los Angeles Municipal Code 4118 has generally not been through the citation or arrest of folks. And we get into fights with politicians all the time about this, who say we're not arresting people for violating 4118. To be clear, many people have gotten tickets for violating the municipal code. But cops don't have to arrest a single person or give out a single ticket to criminalize homelessness or for the city of Los Angeles to get the benefit of its bargain by passing 4118. What we hear from unhoused folks is that the vast majority of enforcement has come simply from law enforcement telling on folks on house folks that they have to move, that they have to go to a different location from the one that they felt most safe. 
And that, to be clear, is the draw of law, laws like 4118. They give law enforcement the authority to move unhoused folks around from more visible and accessible spaces to locations that are frequently less visible, that make unhoused folks more isolated and less safe. At the end of the day, this is the point of criminalization. LAMC 4118 is not a particularly novel ordinance, even in LA County. There's currently a bill before the state legislature that would make 4118 and the, and the prohibitions in that law the law throughout the state of California. And hundreds of cities around California and throughout the country have camping bans that make it a crime to sleep outside. In some places, the goal is to arrest people and to throw them in jail. In other places, like Los Angeles, the goal is to exercise control over where unhoused folks can be. So authorities can simply erase the evidence of homelessness from visible locations, all the while doing nothing to bring people inside. As someone who fights against the criminalization of homelessness, I often get the same types of criticism by people who attack our work. Our work is seen as fighting against policies, not actually fighting to bring people inside. It is true. As a litigator, I am suing to stop unconstitutional practices. And as a movement lawyer, my clients are frequently getting kicked out of City Hall for shutting down meetings where city politicians are debating yet another law that makes it a crime to be unhoused. They're not fighting to reform the laws. You can't reform a law that makes it a crime to be alive. But it is also true at a very basic level that litigating about tents will not bring people inside. To be honest, litigating about tents sometimes won't even save the tents. The United States Constitution provides people with very few practical protections, especially today. And it would be naive to think we can turn to the same courts that have brought us mass incarceration to actually end the criminalization of homelessness. It is also worth noting that fighting to protect folks' civil rights almost never, in and of itself, results in, pov in positive policy solutions. Because constitutional rights are quite literally a floor. Ensuring that cities are not violating the constitutional rights of its citizens is literally the least a city can do. And it is a very low bar to set for our cities. We are asking them not to engage in practices that courts have declared cruel and unusual. Most cities that we are fighting against are fighting to figure out how close to that line they can get. How close they can get to extracting punishment that is not quite cruel enough and not quite unusual enough that it will pass constitutional scrutiny. And in cities like Los Angeles, who have been involved in litigation around the constitutionality of criminalization for decades, the commitment to litigate, litigating on the margins of court orders and to walk as close to the constitutional line as possible remains a significant driver of the city's homelessness policies. But the longer that I have done this work, and quite frankly, the more time that I've spent listening to my clients and to the community organizations that are leading this fight, the more that I have understood that the criticism of our role in the fight to end criminalization completely misses the point. The past 10 years litigating against the criminalization of homelessness hasn't really been about tents. I think that's clear. It's definitely not about jacuzzis. And it's not about the fight to end the destruction of people's property. It's about standing alongside our clients and community members, the people around the streets because of the massive wealth inequality in this country, about who are there because of the city's failed housing policies and the structural and systemic racism that shaped this city's landscapes for generations. It's about preventing people from shifting the blame of the housing crisis onto the people who were most impacted by those failed policies. And above all else, it is about making it harder for politicians and government leaders to erase the visible evidence of those failed policies by violating the rights of folks who are unhoused. By slowly chipping away at the policy choices that they constantly make but do nothing to end the housing crisis, we help make it easier for organizers and tenants and unhoused residents to fight for real policy solutions that actually do result in housing. In 2012, my mentor and often co-counsel, Carol Sobel, won a ruling at the Ninth Circuit in LeVan versus City of Los Angeles, which upheld an injunction that prevented the city from seizing and destroying people's belongings, except in very specific circumstances. 
as a result of that case, and I think she would be proud to say this, even if it's what people say about all of us, tents began to show up in places where residents of the city had never seen them before. To be clear, it's not that there were more unhoused people on the streets as a result of Levan, like people tell us. It's that by preventing the city from throwing away unhoused folks' belongings, house residents were first, were first to see for the first time the number of their neighbors who were actually living on the streets. They saw for the first time the true breadth of homelessness in the city and what the affordable housing crisis was actually doing to its most vulnerable residents. When the city couldn't throw away the tents that had begun to symbolize the city's failed housing policies, more house residents actually started paying attention to the fact that people were living on the streets. And the conversation in the city started to change. As a result, people started demanding better policy solutions. In 2016, voters approved two historic ballot measures, Proposition HHH and Measure H, which provided billions of dollars in funding for permanent supportive housing and services. And in 2019, the California State Legislature expanded, expanded tenant protections for the first time in decades. When the pandemic hit in 2020, unhoused folks and organizers fought hard for protections that allowed unhoused folks to shelter in place, just like housed folks were being ordered to do. By putting off encampment sweeps that had led to the destruction of people's property, and by preventing the city from enforcing laws that made people take their tents down during the day, coupled with our ruling in the case that I talked about, which prevented the city from throwing away unhoused folks' bulky items, including that notorious jacuzzi, it meant that unhoused folks were more visible than they had been in places where they had never been allowed to stay before, in places like Venice Beach and Echo Park. As the pandemic dragged on and the city tried to displace people from these areas, folks fought back. At the end of the day, the city still cleared the encampments at Venice Beach and Echo Park, and they displaced unhoused folks from those areas. But by fighting back against their displacement, by holding ground, by standing strong and refusing to be erased, Residents helped not only fuel the election of the most progressive city council the city has seen in decades, it also helped launch a new model for thinking about how encampments are resolved in this city. That model, which is far from perfect, um, has centered around shelter, not displacement, and has led to significant additional protect investment in the shelter resources and greater protections for folks who are coming inside. The movement against criminalization has also helped support a growing tenants' rights movement in Los Angeles, which has led to a dramatic increase in tenant protections and put the city and county within arm's reach of a codified right to counsel. These are actual real solutions that will do something to end the housing crisis in this city. It will do far more than throwing away a tent ever will. Here in Los Angeles, we are far from the end of criminalization of homelessness. In reality, I don't think that we will ever end criminalization until we end the affordable housing crisis. But every time we get a court ruling that says a city can't throw away a tent for yet another reason that they have invented, or arrest a person for sleeping on the sidewalk, that's one less step the city has, can do to erase the visible signs of homelessness, and one more opportunity that unhoused folks, and tenants, and organizers, and lawyers who are fighting the fight to end the affordable housing crisis have, to actually come up with solutions that will end this crisis. Um, I'm, I wanna say one thing before I turn it over, and that is that I talk a lot about ending the fight of the criminalization of homelessness because that's the direction that I come from. But ending the affordable housing crisis in Los Angeles will also end the criminalization of homelessness. We are in an amazing moment in Los Angeles right now where there are phenomenal opportunities to get involved in the fight for housing justice. When I became a lawyer um, at the LGBT Center working with queer and trans homeless youth, I didn't know what substantive area of law I would practice. But what I heard time and time and time again from my clients was the single most important thing for them was that their housing rights were protected. And that's the direction that I came to this work, um, was listening to unhoused folks and hearing that the fights that they were fighting were about housing. Um, and being a housing justice attorney in Los Angeles and being able to think about the intersections of homelessness and housing has been an incredibly important aspect of doing work on racial justice and criminal justice reform here in Los Angeles. 
So if you all are thinking about it, thinking about what you want to do next, um, I would strongly encourage you to think about housing justice as a fight for racial justice, as a fight for civil rights, um, and as a tremendous opportunity to get involved here in Los Angeles. Um, but that is all I have prepared, so happy to answer questions if folks have them. two questions so sure. I'm sorry if they're long um, but first I want to say thank you because honestly like my mom had me at 19 so she was homeless when she had me initially and like one of the reasons she didn't want to go to shelter and she lived in her car was because it wasn't safe to have like a mother and baby girl um, and I think that kind of goes to my first question because like being at the law school and like you know, it's really interesting because we have these conversations about critical race studies and like all, all of these things and yet like there's still conversations where people are connecting directly like criminality and houselessness like people were saying like they didn't want to do anything near Skid Row because of the crime rate and as you pointed out like the crime rate is informed by the crime being yeah. houselessness, right? Yeah. Like, and so it's been really hard engaging with people um, who feel like they can make this connection in isolation to sweeps, in isolation to criminality of houselessness, and like using like their own personal like safety as an anecdote. And I don't know how you engage people like that. And it's also just disheartening for people who want to be like public interest lawyers, like having someone be your public defender if they wouldn't even want to walk near where you are because you're such a blight to them that you have to not exist, you, you have to not be there for them to want to be around um, a certain area. Yeah. I mean, that is, that is the insidiousness of the criminalization of homelessness, right? That is that is what we do, and we've been doing it in the city for decades. Um, the way we talk about Skid Row um, as blight, like you say, Skid Row is a neighborhood. Um, Skid Row is actually the, has the largest concentration of affordable housing um, in our city. Um, it has a vibrant culture and community, and folks who grew up in Skid Row, and people grew up in Skid Row, that is their neighborhood. Um, <laughs> I'm involved in a case um, involving Skid Row, the LA Alliance for Human Rights versus the City of LA, um, which is about business owners suing the City of Los Angeles um, to basically gentrify Skid Row, I think is a fair way to say it. Um, and they, in one of their pleadings, they put a statistic that said that Skid Row was the most dangerous neighborhood um, in Los Angeles. But here's the problem. When you actually looked at how they calculated crime, they didn't calculate crime. They calculated poverty, literally. So Skid Row was the most dangerous neighborhood because it was the poorest neighborhood. Um, I mean, one of the reasons why I'm very grateful for my law school education, and it sounds like um, I wish you had this, um, I wish more people had this, was the opportunity in Gary Blasey's fact investigation to spend time in Skid Row. Um, and not just to spend time in Skid Row as a tourist, because I think that sometimes happens, but actually to spend time working in Skid Row. Um, there's a clinic that um, UCLA has with um, LA CAN um, and the Legal Aid Foundation. I ran it for many, many years. It's one of my favorite things we do that's in Skid Row. Um, I would encourage your friends to go. I spend a lot of time in Skid Row. I feel safe in Skid Row. Um, but I think just putting it out there and combating that um, is the best any of us can do. It is a cell center clinic, again, after, and so it is possible to sign up um, for it. It's a cool clinic. It's, um, I will say my favorite part about it is that it is, it is the lowest part of entry of any clinic I've ever seen. So normally it's really hard to get legal services in Los Angeles. It's really hard to get through the line at the organization where I work. Um, it is very easy to come to the LA County Clinic. You literally just have to walk up. Um, and the breadth of issues that are dealt with at the clinic, uh, they are vast. Not particularly well trained to deal with some of them, but they are vast. Um, and one of the best parts about it is that it's really an opportunity to just hear folks where they are and see the ways in which legal issues are interacting with their day-to-day -day life. Um, some folks are unhoused. Many folks are housed and facing eviction issues from affordable housing in the area. So. 
Um, definitely encourage you to show up. It's great. I don't want to take away from any student questions, but I do have a couple of questions. And one I wanted to piggyback on the, the clinic you just mentioned, the Yale Central Clinic, because you mentioned in your talk that you um, see yourself as a movement lawyer, and you also mm -hmm. mentioned L.A. Can, which I know some of our students are familiar with them. Um, but it would be great to have to talk a little bit more about that, because one thing I glossed over in your bio was, besides litigating, you actually do a lot of work that's not litigation, I think community ed and training of non-lawyers. And so can you talk a little bit more about the movement lawyering side of your work? Because I know there's a lot of interest here at UCLA amongst public interest students in that idea. Um, I mean, so for me, what movement lawyering means is being part of a movement and standing and walking aside folks who are, who are impacted and organizers um, and taking up the space that they ask us to as lawyers. Um, right, you come from UCLA with a tremendous skill, a tremendous resource um, as a public interest lawyer funded in Los Angeles to do this kind of work. We are few and far between, unfortunately. Um, and so for us, what it means is doing whatever people ask us. Um, sometimes that means litigating. Uh, sometimes that means turning Know Your Rights materials into a zine. Um, sometimes it means showing up at a specific encampment and doing Know Your Rights information. Sometimes it means writing a Brown Act letter to the city council because they passed an ordinance that didn't allow public comment. Um, for me, it's very much just about taking up the space that folks ask us to take up um, and to, to apply that resource that we bring to the table to that movement and the way folks who are impacted want us to. When we file litigation at the Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles, we do it only um, when, as part, in my practice, only as part of movement work where people are trying to advance something and folks have decided that litigating is the right tool. Right? To, litigation is sometimes a really important strategy. Right? I don't think we would have gotten the city of Los Angeles to stop seizing unhoused folks' bulky items unless and until the Ninth Circuit told them they had to. Right? I think that is fair. Um, so when folks say we're at that part, point, then we should litigate. Um, Los Angeles Community Action Network has been around for about 30 years. It is a Skid Row-based black-led organization um, that fights against the criminalization of homelessness and for affordable housing. They're a member-based organization, so in a number of lawsuits, we actually represent the organization and its members. Um, that's a really important way that we can go into court because it means we're not just representing the, the organization, but we're also representing the folks who are part of that organization. So it's a way to sort of extend the, the reach of folks. Um, Garcia versus City of Los Angeles, we represent another amazing community organization, K-Town for All. Um, they are our organization, organizational plaintiff, and we also, also represent their members. Um, and they have been in the fight with us for the past five years. Literally five years. We sued in July 2019. Sorry, I do have one other question. Um, and actually, you just kind of backed into it. So around the, the case you just mentioned with Keaton Brawl, is that the case that you, because you've actually worked with one of our, besides El Central, you've also worked with one of our professors, Kathy Sweetser, who's been on leave this semester, um, some of you have been in the Human Rights Litigation Clinic, many of you are interested in taking that, but you actually worked with some students um, on one of your cases, I think it was that case. So yeah. could you talk a little bit more about that? I don't know if that's ongoing, do you know if that's going to continue on yeah. as a potential clinic matter for students next year? I don't know, Tess. Uh, <laughs> Tess is the staff attorney for the Promise Institute and for yeah. the clinic. Yeah, hi. Um, I think so. Uh, if the case is ongoing, then it will be clinic days, yeah, yeah. Um, So, um, Kathy Sweetser and I have litigated together for 10 years. Uh, so we litigated together before she came to UCLA um, a few years ago. And when she came to UCLA, she brought this case, Garcia versus City of LA, along with her. That case is the one that I mentioned. It's about the due process rights of the couch. Um, it's also about litigating whether and under what circumstances the city can throw away on house folks' property. Um, it is one of the most intensely litigated cases I have ever been involved in. Um, for the past couple of years, we've been involved in some pretty significant um, discovery fights and, and other things. Um, but students have been involved in the case, um, doing some really significant research, helping out with depositions, doing deposition summaries, those kinds of things. 
Um, here's the thing, when you litigate a case like Garcia versus City of LA, maybe it'll be short, probably it will be long. Um, this case, when we set out to bring the case, we knew that we were gonna litigate. Um, you know, when you file it, when you file lawsuits, the City of LA has been litigating these issues for 30 years, right? Like, literally this question of when and under what circumstances they can throw away a tent. And it starts broad, right? And you get the constitutional ruling that says, like, no, like, unhoused folks' property rights are the same as housed folks. Cool. Right? And then it gets more narrow and more narrow and more narrow. And we knew in this case we were going to litigate basically the ultimate question about under what circumstances very precisely the city of Los Angeles could throw away unhoused folks' property without storing it. That is like a fundamental question that is at issue in every single sweep in the city of Los Angeles. And so we knew it was going to be hard fought. So we brought on a ton of resources. We have two huge law firms, Kirkland and Ellis and McGuire Woods. We have a small plaintiff side firm, which is Schoenbrunn, Seplow, Harris, Hoffman, and Zeldis, with UCLA Law Clinic and all of the amazing students. We have my entire project. Um, I think that may be it, but like it is a huge team because um, it's really heavily really fought. But it's also a cool way to get involved as a student. Um, Kathy, I would say, is one of the best mentors I've ever seen um, in terms of working with people. She's very good at supervising students, and the work that we get from the students. It's really phenomenal. It winds up making it, its way into briefs, which is cool. Um, I would have appreciated it as a law student, just something that I had written, made it into a brief. I'm certain that did not happen. So mm -hmm. that's a pitch. I'm just pitching to you all now. <laughs> um, hi, I, I worked uh, as like as an organizer alongside a legal legal aid in Arkansas, and oh, nice. like one thing that was like. Like they never had nearly enough resources to take on all the clients, sure. um, you know, in Arkansas. I'm yeah. wondering if what is it? Is it is it like oh wow in LA we have more res we can what is it like? Is it the same thing here or? It's, I, I laugh specifically because I had a conversation with the director of a legal services organization in Arkansas, literally about this issue because. Because what, what he was saying is like there were so few legal services attorneys for so many people spread out about, around the state. And what I was saying is there's so few legal services attorneys for so many people stacked into the city of Los Angeles. So we have a lot of legal services attorneys, but the rate of attorneys that we have in LA is no more than it is anywhere else in the country. We have one legal services attorney for every 9,000 low income folks. Um, my practice, which focuses on systemic litigation, there are not a ton of positions within Los Angeles where we can do that within a legal services model. It's one of the reasons why I love what I get to do, because I get to work alongside eviction defense attorneys, um, folks who are doing more individual direct services work, to identify and attack systemic problems. It's a very cool way to do this work, because we're, we're all sort of locked arms as movement lawyers and coming at it from different ways. I wish it were the case that we were over-resourced in Los Angeles. I think we are equally under-resourced, just differently so. <laughs> um, and working with organizers, it's, it is a challenge because I think organizers do a phenomenal job of identifying issues that the that community members are facing. And then they have this amazing resource in working with legal services attorneys who are like, I cannot take on another case. I am so sorry. And the organizers are like, but I did all this work and this person is so important to the movement. You've got to do it. And you're like, well, I don't have it maybe. Um, it, it, that tension very much exists in Los Angeles. So then how do you, um, I get, so aside from like picking cases that are important like for organizing and for the movement, like how, what, what is the, what is it, how do you decide which cases to take? I mean, I can, I can assume that every case isn't important for the movement. So there are some other ones, like what, what are the other factors that go in? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there is that idea, you know, bad facts make bad law and good facts make good law. I think when you're doing systemic litigation, you're thinking about what are the facts that I want in front of a judge that are gonna make the opinion and are gonna make the thing that are gonna make the law the strongest or the best is oftentimes how we think about it, right? Um, sometimes, I will say this happened during the pandemic, sometimes you take the fights you have to fight, right? During the pandemic, we, um, we actually brought a case to stop the encampment sweeps during the pandemic. We don't talk about this very often because we lost, uh, and it did not, did not get any publicity. Nobody knew that it happened. We thought that there was a very good chance that we were gonna lose. 
Um, but we brought it anyway because we knew that in that moment it was super important that we bring it anyway, that we devote those resources so that unhoused folks that we were working with knew that we were there alongside them during the early days of the pandemic, right? So you, I think you have to weigh those things, right? And, you, and for us, I think it means weighing them in conjunction with organizers and advocates and unhoused folks, right, who are alongside us in that fight. Every organization has its own priorities um, that are going to shape how that happens. I work in an LSC-funded organization, which I did not say, I think it's obvious I'm not here on behalf of the Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles. Um, I don't think I said anything too outside the limits of what I should say on camera. Um, but, uh, you know, we're funded by LSC, which means Legal Services Court, which means there's limits on what we can do. So, like, for example, we can't bring class action lawsuits. And we can't bring conditions of confinement cases or abortion cases. Um, my organization, I think, does a very, very good job of thinking about how to do systemic litigation and policy work within the confines of those regulations. But sometimes it doesn't make sense for us to be the lead, right? Or even part of the, of the lawsuit if it means there's a strategic or procedural thing we can't do. So um, figuring out what that balance is is one of the hardest things, I think, um, there is as a lawyer. Um, it's always hard, I think, to pick cases. Um, and I think trying to do it honestly and, and um, with accountability to the community is super important. I will say I am incredibly lucky um, that my clients are the organizations that are my clients um, because they hold us incredibly accountable as well. So. Yeah, um, assuming grants pass goes the way that we all think it's going to go. Um, what do you think that uh, impact will be like in LA? Will LA have like, any restraint because of Garcia or other cases, or just because you know, idealistically maybe Karen Bass will not sweep everyone away? Or what do you think the impact will be? Um, I think there are some limitations that exist in settlements and those those kinds of things. But I also think that like folks in Los Angeles have been fighting the criminalization fight for decades, and while on a day to day there are times when it feels like we are losing. I think folks have won some of these fights. I really do not believe that the city of Los Angeles would pass a citywide anti-camping ban, um, which is what they would need to do to fully um, effectuate uh, an overturning of grants pass. I just think that people have fought hard enough and long enough that we are past that. Um, whether or not that's true, who knows, and whether or not I'm just saying it because I have to say those kinds of things, and I think very different things at home when I'm, you know, you know, thinking about what happens in June. Um, I, just, I, 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 the end of the day, I think Los Angeles has found different ways to criminalize homelessness, different ways to erase the visible signs of homelessness, and I think it would be very hard for the city to backtrack like that. It's like they've they've already. They've already moved past that. Um, but I mean, who knows? I think we will, we will see. Um, the one thing that I will say is that none of us are seating the courts on this issue, right? None of us are seating the courts on the issue of the criminalization of homelessness. And we're not seating the idea that it is not cruel and unusual punishment to punish folks for sleeping on the sidewalks. Whether or not the Supreme Court agrees and the US Constitution provides that right, we have a California Constitution that exists. We have other rights that exist. I will say, I, in my time litigating these in 10 years, have never litigated under the Eighth Amendment. I've always litigated under the Fourth and Fourteenth Amendment and the California Constitution. Um, so I just think that it's really important, no matter what this Supreme Court does, is that we all just agree that we're not sovereign. <laughs> okay. On the topic of like lack of resources, which you mentioned earlier, there's, I've heard some discussion about like a universal like right to counsel for like housing stuff. Do you think that is a viable possibility in the near future? And if so, where does that come from considering how overworked all these legal hate lawyers are already? Sure. Did you see that part where I was like pitching hard for you all to join the fight for housing justice? Very like, that's one hundred percent what that is. Um I, I do. I really, really do. If you would ask me five years ago whether I thought we'd have a codified right to counsel or even like a pilot project of a right to counsel, I would have like laughed a lot. Um, my boss at the Legal Aid Foundation is one of the primary drivers of this work. I'm watching her and the coalition that's been built around it is phenomenal to see. People have really changed the conversation and there is a much better understanding that like the fight for housing 
is, is critical to every fight that we are talking about when it comes to civil rights and to send tenants into court without lawyers um, is, is devastating and, and really undermines the legitimacy of our court system. I think we understand that in Los Angeles in ways that we never have before. Um, I, I will say though that I've seen the job postings at LAFLA. I know how hard it is to, um, to fill those positions um, because I think there's also this sense that those jobs are really, really hard. Um, I, I do think they are very hard jobs. I also think they are incredible jobs. I think they are an incredible opportunity to go into court and be part of a movement and do amazing fights. Like, it is absolutely one of those systems. Like, housing in this country and housing in Los Angeles is absolutely one of those places um, where racial justice is directly implicated, right? Because the idea of who owns land in this country and who owns land in Los Angeles versus who rents and who gets kicked out um, is critical to the fight for racial justice. And so people who are doing eviction defense work are really doing front lines work in defending people and ensuring that they get to stay housed. Um, I mean, I'm just going to keep saying that time and time again. Be eviction lawyers. It's an amazing way to be part of a really, really important movement in Los Angeles. I mean, you, you all can come on Wednesday. I will say that like six times. <laughs> you can come sit down with me at office hours. I will say that like six times. Unless you tell me you're already going to do it, and then we can talk about whatever you want. Yes. Yeah, um, I was, my first job out of law school was also doing eviction defense with their housing, so hard plug for that. It's an <laughs> amazing job if you want to talk about it. Um, my question was, other than working for specific clinics or maybe with specific professors, do you have any advice for students on how to start becoming a movement lawyer during law school and in their first job? I mean, I would say be, be, be conscientious about the organizations you work for and how they think about, um, like, where you spend your summers and how they think about lawyering, right? Um, different organizations think about lawyering in different ways. In Los Angeles, we're really, really lucky to have a really progressive legal services bar who think about legal services within the context of movement lawyering. I would say I've been at the Legal Aid Foundation for 10 years because of its commitment to racial justice, because of its commitment um, against the criminalization of justice, of criminalization of housing and racial justice, and because when I say things in the press about our city government, they tell me good job, they do not tell me they're worried about our funding, um, you know, those kinds of things. So pick the organizations that are going to support um, support that work and understand that direct services work can be part of movement lawyering. Um, but also, like, spend your summers doing, doing the things that you want to do. The two summers that I spent in law school, I spent working on queer and trans issues at national LGBT organizations, um, which got me sort of interested in movement lawyering, but also made me think differently about how I wanted to move my trajectory forward, like, substantively what I wanted to work on. Um, but also just, like, get to know people, come to talks, see what works. Good job, great. Um, read Amazing Movement Scholars. I was lucky Dean Spade was one of my professors when I was here, which is phenomenal. Get to know Carmina, who is, who is one of my favorite people and we went to law school here. <laughs> there is going to be a talk that the Health Law Society is doing on the Grants Pass case that Jayla mentioned with the Veterans, with El Centro Veterans Clinic on April 15th, in case you want to learn more about that case. And they're also going to have the oral arguments watch. Uh -huh. So if you're interested in those two events, um, I think we will have those listed in the public interest email. So if you're not already getting our weekly emails, um, you can let me know and we'll make sure that you get the next edition um, of that. And I also just want to jump in here because we are at an hour, um, which is the informal, and I want to formally close the talk um, and start by saying, asking you to join me. Thank you so much for coming and for your very impassioned um, plea for more folks to join in the housing justice work and movement.
Um, I did want to reinforce that if you um, are interested in either having um, time with Shayla, because she's been she's um, prepared to do office hours, and we have time available on Wednesday, um, but also the career talk. So if you're not RSVP'd or ready, please just let me know. Um, we can make room for you, but we do need to know if you would like to come. Um, and it will be a chance to both you know, hear her personal story um, in more detail, um, including, I thought this was fascinating, that um, the judge she clicked for is not a known liberal judge, and I know this is a number one question for public interest students, is what if I get a judge that is not aligned with me? Um, so I think there are lots of great additional conversations to have with Shayla. I really want to encourage folks to come on on Wednesday for that. Um, so thank you all for being here on your first day back from break. Thank you to Shayla. And for those who want lunch, um, it is out the back doors when you leave. Thank you, Shayla and everyone.